So what happened next in the field of antibiotics? Well, people said salvacin's really good, but it only treats syphilis. How do we treat other kinds of bacteria? And essentially, a whole set of drugs was developed by a company called Bayer, who developed also aspirin and heroin. They were looking for their next big drug. And they were interested in using azo dyes to kill bacteria. The reason for this is they were the biggest manufacturer of azo dyes in Europe. They had sheds full of the things, and they thought, I wonder if these kill bacteria. These are the dyes that are used to dye clothes, right? It seems like a crazy thought, but I'll just walk you through why they did that. If you look at the structure of salvarsan, it is an arsenic azo dye. Arsenic's below nitrogen in the periodic table. It has an arsenic-arsenic double bond, just like the nitrogen-nitrogen double bond. So it wasn't crazy to think these similar structures might work. It is not at all the reason why they ended up working, by the way. And as I just noted, Bayer was number one in the dye industry. Why not try and spread that expertise into pharmaceuticals and make a whole load more money out of the things you already make. So they tested the dyes in vitro, that means in glass, so in a test tube or on a petri dish, and in vivo, on mice infected with streptococcus. And they found that Prontosil Red was active in the mice, not so much in the glass, not in the not in the Petri dish, but active in the mice. And this was Prontosil Red. This is Prontosil Red here. This isn't the structure. We'll come back to this. But it's a very red thing. This is an early pharmaceutical Prontosil Red. It is bright red ampules that they had here. It's worth just thinking about how they made this thing. I'm not too particularly interested in the synthesis, but given you've all done aromatic synthesis in the past, this reaction... Thinking forward, this is azo dye formation. You're reacting this dye azo with this aromatic species. It's an activated aromatic ring that can attack the electrophilic azo diazonium salt here. That's how you make azo dyes in general. You react a diazonium salt with some sort of activated aromatic. This diazonium salt is very easily made by taking an amine and treating it with nitrous acid and HCl. This is a diazotization reaction. Again, this is first year aromatic chemistry. Aromatic chemistry, heterocyclic chemistry, and carbonyl chemistry lie at the heart of much medicinal chemistry, okay? That's why they're taught to you as being so important in early years of organic chemistry. So we've made the diazonium salt from this. Um, and this is interesting. We'll come back to this. It's relatively easy to make. I'm just going to walk you through, going all the way back to a simple thing. Uh, you've done some protecting group chemistry. You can knock the protecting group off with a base. Um, ammonia would convert that chloride through to that sulfonamide. Oh, sorry, that's my fault. Yeah. And that sulfonyl chloride will sulfonylate your aromatic ring. Um, I'm not expecting too much detail, just to show you that this is a relatively straightforward synthetic process using fairly standard... Uh, nucleophilic substitutions and aromatic reactions uh, to get through to this key compound here, this nice simple compound. And what they found was that actually when they did more studies, they tested each thing from their synthetic pathway, which is the reason for putting it up, to see if these were active against bacteria as well. So this was active against bacteria. But what they found was that this intermediate was also active against 
bacteria. So they didn't really need that full azo dye structure. And the reason they're called sulfur drugs is that this contains this sulfonamide functional group here. And this is quite important. So they had something where the azo dye was active and the sulfonamide synthetic intermediate was also active. What they found in their studies, as I already hinted, is that prontosil red, so although prontosil red was active in the mouse, in vivo, it was not active in vitro. If you just expose bacteria to this azo dye, it did nothing at all. And this is because in the body, the prontosil red gets converted into that sulfonamide. So once again, it was actually a prodrug that was being converted to the active drug within the body. So this is the active drug and the prontosil red was a prodrug. It was prescribed as a prodrug for a lot of years, as you can see from the red ampules. Um, it took some time after the development of the drug to really understand that the simple sulfonamide was actually the active form. And then what they learned was that lots of sulfonamides were active against bacteria. They could change them quite a lot and they'd still be active against bacteria. And this led to a new principle in medicinal chemistry, the idea of what's called a pharmacophore. And what a pharmacophore is, it's the bit of a drug that makes it work. It's the essential bit of the structure you need for it to be active. So a pharmacophore is the essential part of a drug required for activity. And in this case, it was a nitrogen functionalized aromatic ring attached to a sulfonamide. And you could put different things here and different things here. If you took off one of the hydrogens, you could modify it on either end and it was still an active drug. And of course, synthetic chemists in that era could very easily make compounds like this. It's standard aromatic chemistry. We've sort of looked at the synthesis. I didn't dwell on it too much because this isn't a synthetic course, but it was all reactions that you've met somewhere else in the course. And typically those early reactions are kind of 19th century reactions. And so they could make all sorts of modified versions, uh, which you can call analogs. And then they could find the most effective of those. And that gives you what's called structure activity relationships, an idea that we'll keep coming back to in this course. You change the structure, it changes the activity a bit, you try and find the most active of these compounds against the bacteria to optimise the drug and make it work the way you want. But the question is, why does it work? Because now it looks nothing like the arsenic-containing compound. There's no way that sulfur enzymes are doing anything with this. And anyway, that would only really work for syphilis. And these things killed most bacteria. Okay? So people wanted to understand why this stops bacteria. And it was the first really quite broad spectrum antibiotic. So there's something that, again, we do that's different to what bacteria do. And that lies at the heart of how these drugs work. So, humans eat folic acid. It's a really important nutrient. You may know that particularly pregnant mothers, um, they need to um, build up their levels of folic acid 
in the body and uh, they supplement bread and things like that with folic acid. It's a very important dietary nutrient. And we eat it in our diets. It applies to all of us. Bacteria don't eat it, but it's still really important for bacteria. Bacteria must make it. And so bacteria have enzymes to make folate, folic acid, folate, folate's just the deprotonated form. And we don't. It's a fundamental difference between us and bacteria. So what happens is the sulfonamides bind to enzymes that make folate. And by doing that, they inhibit them. They stop them working. They block up their active sites and stop them from making folate. So again, this difference is why we can think of this drug as a magic bullet. And if bacteria can't make folate, the bacteria will die. This is the structure of folic acid here. Folate, if it was just deprotonated, which it will be at pH 7. So why would sulfonamide bind to folate synthesis enzymes? Well, let's look at the structure of the pharmacophore of the sulfonamide. We've got this nitrogen functionalized on a benzene. Then we've got a sulfur. And so on. There is the pharmacophore. And what I want you to see is that this pharmacophore looks very similar to the central part of folate, which the enzymes bind to when they're building folate and putting the bits on the end. They bind that middle bit. And what happens is they bind the sulfonamide instead. It's a pretty good substitute for the folate, but they can't do any chemistry with it. They obviously can't turn it into the folate that they're trying to make. And so this blocks the enzymes that are trying to make this compound. So it binds to folate synthesis enzymes because it's a, essentially it's a mimetic to folate. They had no idea when they developed these drugs. They, as I said, just thought they were making an azo dye equivalent of salvacin, but ultimately they stumbled into this class of drugs that has a completely different mode of action that's all connected with stopping bacteria making folate. Nothing to do with inhibiting sulfur-containing enzymes. So these sulfonamide drugs were developed in like the late 20s and the early 30s. They really were the first antibiotics. They're still used in veterinary medicine. They're not so much used in human medicine. Unfortunately, they have really bad solubility and they tend to crystallize in the kidneys a bit. So you had to take them with really large amounts of water. And lots of, it still is often said, yeah, that you've got to take certain medicine with plenty of water. These were the very first medicines. You really had to drink lots of water with these to flush out your kidneys from the crystals. Otherwise, you got like kidney stones from these drugs. So taking water with them really was important. They weren't optimal drugs and they can be improved. They have low activity and have to be taken in relatively large quantities. So they do crystallize out in the kidneys significantly. And as such, they've been largely superseded. It's quite interesting. There's a company that takes some of our placement students every year. Uh, and one of the things that they're doing, actually, one of their projects, is to reinvigorate sulfur drugs 
for the human market. They can still be used in the human market and there's still the opportunity to make new analogues of them. And as bacteria become more resistant to some of the other drugs, exploring some of these old drugs where the resistance pathway will be completely different is quite an interesting option. So funnily enough, the fact they've fallen out of use makes them of a little bit more interest in a modern setting. Like I said, they're still used a bit in vet medicine as well. Um, but largely, they've been superseded.